Welcome to the New Judge Juan podcast. This is episode six. In this episode, Jess and I discuss the teachings of Kenichi Suwai, Bruce's teacher in the art of Taiki Ken um, in Japan. Uh, then we talk about the scanning and feeling aspects of the standing practice in energy gates and how to awaken your body and sort of do the preparatory stuff for the actual standing and dissolving. Okay, I uh, hope you enjoy the show and thanks for listening. <laughs> All right, so where we left off with opening the energy gates of your body, um, we were talking about the standing alignments that are part of the set and the importance of those. Um, we we're also looking at this uh, biographical part here in the forward, where uh, Kumar's talking about the various different teachers he had over the years uh, in Beijing. Uh, then he talks about uh, his early history in New York, some great stories there and adventures, and ends up going to Tokyo. And uh, since we've been talking about his studies, uh, we wanted to bring up a few things from some of the uh, other teachers he had early in his career that were working on standing, where he was learning standing. Um, and since you and I have both been way into standing over the years and enjoyed a lot, we wanted to look again at uh, Kenichi Sawai, the, the uh, teacher of standing in the park that he did for quite a bit. He talks about it in, in his books. Um, he goes through the history of it, and he calls his martial art Taiki Ken. Um, so here's a little quotation. The principle of Chi, or as he calls it, the principle of Ki, without which there could be no Taiki Ken, is not especially difficult. Though there are differences in its strengths, Ki is found in everyone. Students of the martial arts attempt to train their Ki to the point where, upon coming into contact with an opponent, they can give full manifestation of it. This is only as it should be, since there would be no meaning in training, no matter how assiduous if the individual found himself incapable of bringing forth his key at the moment of need. So, I mean, this speaks to the philosophy of this school where your energy or your, your output of strength is the entire purpose of standing. It's to make you strong and powerful, and if an opponent comes near, uh, you give your full manifestation of your energy. So he uses the term key to express that. I interpret that as you using your force to slam somebody if they try to attack you, basically. Right. I, I think it's also the, the piece about E, mm. intent, right? So, like, you know, the, the if, if you get down to the idea of chi is already in your body. Mm. You can't bring chi, you know, you can direct it, you can concentrate it, you can do things with mm. it, you can even build it up, but the, you know, the what he's really, really talking about is intent. You know, is is the mind and the, the ability to bring your whole being into you know your body, your mind, everything into what it is that you're doing. So you know that that is the essence of Xing Yi, right? The Xing the body and Yi the mind have to become one thing. And you know the whole piece of standing is the that, as Bruce would say, you know the gelling of those two, those two pieces, the you know the mind. The, the conscious mind, you know, that directs things and the body that is directed by that conscious mind. So, I mean, you know, we've been talking this whole time about the idea of, like, unifying the body. Like, standing is the way it all comes together. It, more than any other exercise, it really connects all the different parts of you and just creates this sort of unified whole. And I think that must be what he's talking about here. Yeah. He's using it's the phrase the, key, but right. it's wholeness. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, it's the jumping off point for all the other things that unify the body, like cloud hands and the swings and stuff. But, it, right. you know, without the standing, you don't have the awareness to do the other stuff. And I think that's... <laughs> right. The, you know, I mean, because this paragraph is so t telling because he starts off by talking about the principle of key. And then the next thing, he talks about contacting an opponent. And then, you you know... Yeah, you, he's... Yeah. I right. mean, this is the martial arts of what's important about key. And if, if you talk in, you know... People are often interested in energy or how that's translated in well, Chinese or whatever, but he thinks of it as a combat. Right, and I think Bruce, you know, when he was Skill. teaching it, when he was teaching it back in the, the you know nineties or whatever, it was definitely more about you know an adjunct to your martial arts skill. You know, right. Or, you know that the the they're not even martial arts that just just life. You mm. know that the strength is you know a useful thing to have in life, whether mm. it's against an opponent, you know, whether the opponent is like a human being or, you know, <coughs> something you have to pick up and move, you know, it's still the same, you know, you're, you're still using your body. So, uh, I think, you know, that martial arts is just right. a really good 
example of I guess what's yeah it's, what strikes me the most is this feeling of uh, you know, chi can be so many different things. You can use it to describe so many different parts of life and there's a medical context, but he just, it's not just martial. It's also that sense of it's, it's part of your everyday life. It's something you can express. You'd be, if the individual, you, uh, no, uh, sorry. If the individual found himself incapable of bringing forth his chi at the moment of need, uh, this training, you know, was useless, which is like, that's pretty cool because yeah. that, that tells you chi is something you use and you feel and you experience. It's yeah, not it, it goes something that, fluffy out in outer space. That pragmatic nature of, you know, Taoist practices that it has to have some sort of usefulness. Right. You know, the Zhuangzi idea of, you know, what is useful is, you know, that that's another question. But, you know, the whole idea of it is that everything you do has to be, in some sense, useful. Right. Like, I just, I want to keep harping on this because it's like... Chi can't be something that doesn't exist that's sort of a fantasy in your mind. It's a sensation you're experiencing that's making you feel better, move better, be more resilient, be more unified. So it's like a descriptive term more than an actual thing is my sense of how he's using it here. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the the question of quote-unquote what is Chi, I think, is, isn't that one of the, the next pieces in the... Uh, yes, we'll you. be getting to that soon. Yeah, so, you know, th that's a, the whole discussion in terms of, you know, I, to keep it short, I think it has to do with layers, right? So you can talk about the chi of the mind, the chi of the body, the chi of the liver, the, you know, <clears throat> the chi of a walnut, you know, every, you know, there are different kinds of chi. So when they, when they talk about it in a martial sense, I think, yeah, it's, it's that sort of, you know, thing about your, your body, your mind, your everything being right. one piece. Right. I think that's a characteristic of the opening the energy gates set in the sense that the chi shouldn't be something you're pretending. The chi is something you're accessing and engaging with and it's making your practice better in some way. Right. It's already there. You just have to unlock it. And that's not something you do as a click. It's something that happens Ooh. over time to degrees. Yeah. It's, it's not like I understand chi now. It's more like I understand it better than I did yesterday. Right? Well, the, the you know, Bruce's uh, analogy is the layers of an onion, right? That, that at each layer of the onion, you know, you might feel like you've achieved a certain level of proficiency, right? But then when you peel the next layer, it's kind of like you're starting over again and have to go through the whole process again to refine whatever what you know whatever particular thing you were doing. And that's why standing is, you know, a never-ending process. I mean, mm. you, you never get to the end of it because you can always go a little bit deeper into your mind and feel your body a little bit more. It's the, you know, so that's the sort of nice part about it. Is it doesn't have a defined end to it. It's just how much you choose to put into it. It's a tool. It's part of your training. It's part of what makes you better in some way that you want to be. So I... I love the way he puts it as something that's a strength yeah. and sort of squashes the idea that this has to be something up in, up in your head. So just to finish this paragraph, check this out. There is no method for ensuring the ability to call upon the strength of Qi, but standing Zen, as practiced by specialists in the martial arts in China, as employed in Ta Cheng Chuan and Tai Chi Ken, can develop a capability to do so. So he says the best way to call upon the strength of Qi is standing Zen. Like, above yep. all the other different I, ways, standing you know, Zen. Right, and this is a Japanese guy saying that about Chinese martial arts. Right, which is quite a compliment, it says right? a lot. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, I think that's, again, we've been talking about that. I feel like I can't, I've come to the conclusion that of all the different training we've done, it seems like the standing really sets the bar for how well you can do maybe in the other other stuff. Yeah, I mean, Bruce has got, you know, the two phrases, the from posture to posture, the internal energy is unbroken. Right. And one part moves, all parts move. One part stops, all parts stop. And those both essentially go to that piece about if it's not integrated the way it was when you were standing, mm. when you move, it's not, you know, shingy or tai chi or you know, internal arts. It's you've lost that piece. It's almost as if your ability to achieve high things in say something like tai chi or bagua your standing practice is going to help set your overall unification level to make all the other stuff more fruitful. Yeah. I can see how uh, 
you know, the philosophy of opening your energy gates is affected by, by these teachings from uh, Master Kenichi. Well, and, and, yeah, it's also interesting to see how they're different, you know, I mean, essentially it's the same, you know, he had the same teacher as uh, Wang Xu Jing and Han Qing Yuan, right, all these guys that Bruce studied with, um, you know, all came from this sort of martial standing tradition, mm. you know, and that that piece of it was just a inherent, you know, or like a fundamental piece of the whole training. It seemed to have struck him with all his quite, teachers, you know. Yeah, I mean, he seemed, you know, it made which, a big impression on him. Which sort of then brings you, you know, to Leo Hong Jae, which is a whole discussion of the film, right. but you know. Maybe that's next episode. Yeah. All right, so I'd like to continue down here just a little bit longer because I think some of this is so fundamental to energy gates. It's, yeah. When a person begins standing Zen, his mind is clouded with all kinds of thoughts. Soon, however, he will experience pain in his hands, feet, or hips. When this happens, all of his thoughts concentrate in the part of the body that hurts, and he is unable to think of anything else. That's pretty uh, yeah, cool. I mean, so you start with cloudy he's thoughts, and then you feel pain. He's <laughs> describing literally everybody's, you know, the, uh, right. experience the first time they stand. You know, I love it. Like yeah. instead of it being this lofty thing, it's like first your thoughts get clouded, then it starts hurting. Well, somewhere in that book, he says something to the effect of, you know, when I first started standing, I didn't know why I was doing it, and I, you know, asked my teacher, "Why do you do this?" And he basically said, "Shut up and do it," and you know. That's what I tell my students now, you know, that, that there is no answer to it. It's, it's like you either have it or you don't, and it's like you'll know when you do. <laughs> so true. So just continuing from there. The pain figuratively removes the hurting part of the body from the realm of sense perception. As one continues to suffer discomfort of this kind for a period of years, one cultivates the ability to derive great refreshment from standing Zen. Before one is aware of it, the power of key begins to grow to maturity. I mean, I think essentially that's a his the ice to water part, right? Mm. That 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 you start off rigid and everything is pain and you know sensation, and then as you relax into it, it becomes more just you know you enjoy it. You you you, be, you know I don't, if it ever becomes easy, but it it becomes not a you know not a struggle. AKA the 70% rule, right? Mm -hmm. And I love how it says, before one is aware of it, the power of key begins to grow to maturity. And that speaks to how standing, standing builds on itself. You might feel like crap one day doing it, and you do it anyways. Then you yeah. feel good one day and you do it, but it builds on itself until oh. you become way more comfortable. <laughs> and then that feeling of key, of chi. I mean, I think everybody's had it. the experience of, you know, not feeling great, not wanting to go to class. But you mm. suck it up, you go to class anyway, and you stand for an hour, and at the end of that hour, you feel way better than you did right. when you got there, and you think, oh, I'm really glad I came to class. And, you know, he calls it refreshment. Right, so that's, you know, I think that's the piece about just it rejuvenating your body and giving you a little bit more pep. Right. Yeah, I mean, these this are pretty classic stanzas here. All right, so one last thing. I suffered when I practiced standing Zen with my teacher, Wang Shang Zai and wonder what good such practice would ever do to me. When I felt this way, Wang would tell me, even if I explain it to you hundreds of times, you will not understand Qi. It is something that you must experience yourself. Yeah, so that's it. Yep, that's the one. All right. So moving on in the book to lesson two, scan your energy body. So we worked on the alignment so far. Now we move on to the next lesson. It's interesting here. that he says scan your energy body. Not just scan your body. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's gone. Yeah. Slowly observe any energy imbalances in your body. While standing in the posture described in lesson one, scan your body internally from top to bottom. Beginning at the top of your head, start to notice places in your body where you feel any tension, strength, discomfort, or anything else that doesn't quite feel right. The old the mantra. That's the same old mantra. There it is. I mean, and that says it all right there. You scan your body internally from top to bottom. Noticing that the first one is strength, right? He's talking about that sense of being, you know, tense, tense, you know, but, but that's the sense of feeling strong is the first thing you try to, you know, acknowledge at least, you mm. know, I just find it interesting. Then the second being, uh, oh no, the first is tension, tension. Yeah. second is strength. But those, you know, I mean, 
Yeah, it's hard to tell the difference between those two. Well, the, the uh, tension is two things pulling against each other. Okay. Strength is one thing just sort of being, you know, dominant. That's the way you described it at one point. <clears throat> then next comes discomfort, so that would include pain, I'd imagine. Yeah, that's, well, yeah. That's the easiest that's one That's the 70% find. one, right? That's the piece about, are you comfortable? You know, that, that he started with in terms of, you know, your stance should be comfortable. So now you're taking that sense of your comfortable stance and moving it into your, you know, comfortable internal world, you know. And it's interesting, too, because we were just talking about Taiki Ken, and his thing is, you know, you're experiencing pain when you start standing. Right. That's I mean, going to jump out of you right from the it's, start. It's basically the same thing, you know, stand there and feel the pain. And the blessing of pain is that it's the easiest thing to feel. So I think one of the commands in this is to feel inside your own body. And I think for a lot of people that can be hard at first. I know it was hard for me at first, but the one thing you're sure to feel is pain. Right. I mean, the pain is by no means the, it's the only thing you want to feel. But right. It's, it's the one thing everybody can relate to as that's a feeling I know. Mm. You know, when you start talking about what is strength, what is weakness, what is tension, those things are a little more amorphous, you know, but everybody has the, the sense of, you know, I'm strong enough to pick something up. I'm not strong enough to pick up another thing, you mm. know, that, that, that's a pretty, con and so I think that's why it's, it's, it's first. And then the last one is that anything that just doesn't quite feel right, and he always puts that one in there. Yeah, well, that's the that's the important one, right? Because that's where it's like you don't you can't define the feeling, but it's just you can't put your finger on it, but it doesn't feel quite right. Those are the ones you know that that often are indicators of something that will could later become a problem, you know. And so, how you you sort of as a preventative thing, it's those ones that don't feel quite right, that haven't yet become pain, you know, that you, you can, if you address it at that point, it's a little easier to manage. And sometimes I like to think of that one as a, maybe a dark place. So like if you're feeling the inside of your body, if there's an area you can't feel, maybe it's numb, maybe it's dark, maybe you can't see that area. Bruce uses the term fog. Fog. It's like you hit a, you hit like you're driving along a road, and you know all of a sudden you hit like a, a night, and you hit a big foggy patch, and you know you, you can sort of vaguely tell where you are on the road, but you can't see much in front of you, and, and I think that's what that that sense of not having an awareness yet is is that sort of fogginess. And, you know. and it reminds me of the uh, the clouded thoughts that come up when you start start standing sure. as well. Yeah, clouds. So when you scan internally from top to bottom, that brings us to the top of the head. Right. Well, I mean, even it starts even above your head, right? I mean, mm. the, the, the sense of awareness starts just a bit above your head, and that as you come down to that point at the top of your head, that's kind of where it, like, kicks into gear, you know? So that by, byway spot at the top of your head is where you begin, you fall from above that, and so that point is, they call it the crown of the head, the tip yeah. of your head. That's right, basically it's the highest point on the top of your head. Some people have their head back a little bit though, it might. Right, you, yeah, I mean. If, if you stretch yourself as tall as you can and then sort of put your palm on the top of your head, you'll feel the peak of your head. That's, yeah, I mean. That's a byway point. Well, you can get close enough. I mean, it doesn't have mirror. to be perfect. You can look in a mirror if you need to. You can't if you're not sure. Well, I'm just thinking of a lot of people over the years we've worked with of like some have sort of a crane neck. Well, so they think the, the top think of their head is more forward than or it actually more back, is. depending on which oh, way their so head tilts, right? Lean forward, yeah. I mean, so yeah, it, you just kind of have to, you know. But the the main thing is that if the the head is centered and the chin is parallel to the floor, it'll pretty much be right above the spine, right? Like you know that that line from the center of your head. Through, to your spine is what you're looking at, you know. So your head's over your shoulders and not to the side or anything like that. So well balanced over your shoulders rather than leaning. Yep. So people could look in a mirror if there's no one around to like. Yeah, I mean, with. ideally you don't look in a mirror, you have someone check you or, you know, whatever. I mean, because, you know, a mirror may not tell you everything either, but yeah, it definitely you know, can help you in make the age sure of cell phones, straight, you, you know, know, you can just take set, a picture, yeah. set up your cell phone and, you know, film yourself doing it for 
10 seconds and, you know, just look at your alignments from different angles. I mean, it's not the That's best an way. interesting idea. Not the best way to do it, but it works, you know. Having having a teacher to, like, correct you would probably be the idea. Yeah, I mean, because there's all sorts of things about when you look at yourself, you tend to, like, have, you know, different kinds of judgments and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but, uh, yeah, you just, it, it's an option. And when we do this in class, a lot of times your partner will like put a hand on top of your head, and then you sort of let the top of your crown rise. So you right. can sort of like meet their. This is where contact. Bruce talks about the the ding, right? The sense of not that you're lifting your head up, but there's this slight pressing up upward of of this crown of your head. And so this uh, scanning begins at that point. Why? Why? I mean, why's probably don't matter that much. But I do think that there's some helpful reasons for why you would start at the top and then drop down. Well, the simplest reason is that, you know, it, <coughs> the simplest reason is that because if you're trying, you know, if your goal is to get your energy to start dropping, right, if you start at the top, it, you know, it, it's a bit like a, um, an avalanche or something. As it gets down towards the bottom, which tends to be the harder part to feel, you've got more you know, juice behind it, right? Mm. So, that, I mean, that's always been my experience is that, you know, starting with the feet, um, you know, for, la you know, leaving aside all the stuff about, you know, it being not the safest way to do it, it's just harder, you know? Mm. So, so you start with the stuff that, you know, everybody can feel their head. It's, you know, it's, it's accessible. You know? It's so, true. So head and hands are kind of like the things that you always use first because they can feel them. Very good, very good point. So he recommends that you feel from the top of your head all the way down. So you go through your body all the way down to the uh, bottom of your feet. Um, continue this process below your feet if possible. Right, so that's the same thing as you start a little bit above, you go down, you go a little bit below. So you're, you're getting that whole range of the... As he calls it the energy body. Because, you know, as I said, it was interesting that he says energy body, not body. Scan your energy body. Because it, it does include. You're technically. Right, it does include that little bit above and below. So it's not so just the physical. What is the energy body? Or what space does it occupy? Well, again, it has levels, layers, right? So there are the eight bodies that Bruce talks about that extend all the way out, you know, as far as you can go. Um, but the one in terms of this stuff is it goes from the Wei Chi, which is just that little bit above, you know, where your skin is to about, you know, average about a foot away from your body. So like a marsh, a giant marshmallow man or Michelin man, sort of like, yeah. So, you, you know, yourself. on a, on a re reasonably healthy person, the point above the head's maybe, you know, eight inches above the head or something like that, you know, and same with the one below but you can extend that sense of feeling beyond that it's just you know what's well, kind of the range of your warmth of your body the range of your sensation in a sense. I mean that's a good way to start with I mean it does have a very specific boundary but that's not really a thing you deal with in energy gate so it's not worth you know spending a ton of time on right um, when you get into spiraling energy body then that's where you're going from that first boundary that's a foot away from you to maybe one that's three or four feet away from you. And now you have this much larger sense of, you know, where your field is. Um, you know, and one of the things that, that people always say about Bruce is how he takes up a lot of space, energy, <laughs> you know, not just physically, but energetically. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. why it's because his field is, you know, he can expand and can, you know, his field. And when you're not used to being around someone whose field is open, it, it is sometimes unsettling, sometimes pleasant, but it, 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 people do have an, a, a, you know, are affected by it. So a reaction. Yeah. You know, the stories about Wang Shu Jing, you know, people warming their hands on them right. and stuff like that. That's, that's that same feel. Some, some kind of feel. Yeah. So continuing from there, um, he, he makes, he's clear that you, you know, your awareness <laughs> is what's more important than causing anything to happen at this point. You're just moving your awareness. So... Then he moves into helpful hints for awakening your chi. So that reveals that what lesson two is all about. You know, this is this is actually dealing with energy, which is just like in Tai Chi Ken, 
it's all about the key. You know, the standing process is about awakening your body's chi or key. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. I think here. the key word there is awakening it. Right, mm. that it's something that's already there. You just have to, you know, get it to come up, you know, and the, the, to to feel it, and you know, not that it's something that you're making happen or you know, forcing, you know. Right, it's not like you're building up your yeah. chi from a hundred to five hundred right. or something it's like that. It's not some, you know, magical thing. It's like it's just your own sense of awareness of your body leads to this thing that, you know, the ancient guys called chi. You know, but. But you can call it whatever you want, you know, it just has to do with your ability to use your mind to contact your body and the resulting feelings that come from that, you know, and leaving out any Chinese terms, you know. Sure. So it's yeah, it's good. pretty raw, fundamental human experience. Yeah. It's not like some lofty thing that only the sages can right. fly and through I the think It's sometimes good to not think about these things in terms of these, you know, um, I think sometimes it's good to think about these things not so much in terms of like metaphors and you know fancy you know, analogies and stuff, but to just sort of try to relate it to what is the thing I'm trying to do with my body and my intent, you know, because everything's going to come down to, you know, you're either trying to do something with your mind, something with your body, or both, and and you know just to sort of keep that clear clarity about which one you're in the moment using. Mm. So the first of the helpful hints, number one, take your time. Mm. Usually it will take from 15 minutes to an hour to accomplish what we call awakening the chi. So, you know, I, I agree that a nice, at least 15 minutes of standing there, you can start to do more than you could if it was just five minutes. Yeah. In an ideal world, you know, sure. But again, do what you can. Don't, you know, don't, don't set yourself up for failure and right. say, if I, if I can't, if do I can't 20, do 15 minutes, yeah, you're not going to yeah, do it. Right. That's, that's silly. Yeah. You know. Internal scanning is a feeling, not a visualization exercise. In doing your internal review, you may not have directly felt your body, but merely visualized it. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of those things that over time you, you know, in the beginning you may have to visualize, but. Yeah. One of the things that, that Bruce talked about is if you're going to visualize, visualize what it feels like to feel it, you know, so, so have the visualization be about the feeling, not about the, you know, cr you know a picture. Um, <clears throat> and, but, you know, that was, that's always been hit, one of his big uh, emphasis that, you know, a little bit of feeling is better than a lot of imagination. You know, so if you can feel something even just a little bit and you can let your mind just, you know, settle with it, that's going to get you further, at least in this, than creating a bunch of pictures in your mind. Fully comprehending the whole topic, but not being able to feel anything. Yeah. I mean, it's, it would be nice, uh, I guess, on an intellectual level, but you wouldn't, ha you wouldn't get much from it in well, terms of... He speaks to that by saying, you need to, quote, you need to allow yourself to feel the actual state of your insides. So he, he, and he emphasizes the term, allow yourself. So right. I think well, yeah. that speaks to what you're saying. There's, there's really not something you can be forced. You can allow yourself... And no, that takes effort. The hardest you know, part. that yeah. takes effort, right? No, I think that's the hardest part, man, is just, you know, getting your conscious mind, your, your, if you will, your will out of it and just letting that which is there be there and feel it, you know? That can be the hardest part of all. It's, yeah, by far. But just like Kenichi Sawai said in the book, over time, it slowly becomes... Well, mature. Mature. Yeah. And then it's refreshing. All right, that's a good one for now. Let's talk again soon. Okay. Hey, it's Isaac uh, here again. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, just a quick reminder to like and subscribe. And also, I'm going to be doing a Energy Gates workshop on the first swing on March 14th. So if you're interested in that, you can check out the website, www.watertradition.com. Thanks. Have a good one.